The speaker for today's presentation is Andrea Goodkin of Hub International. Hub International is the fifth largest global insurance brokerage firm providing employee benefits and property casualty products and services. Andrea is a leader within Hub International's human resources consulting practice with 27 years of human resources leadership and consulting experience. She specializes in building and developing high-performing human capital programs, systems, and teams. She has a bachelor degree from the University of Washington, advanced coursework from Stanford, and is a SHRM Senior Certified Professional. I'd like to turn the presentation over to Andrea. Andrea, please. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Skip. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, and today, we're going to take a look forward at the business transformation brought about by the coronavirus crisis. And we'll do this by reimagining the workforce through engagement, learning, performance, recruiting, technology, and a little bit about what comes next. So we're going to start with engagement and drive, dive right into culture. So an organization's culture is its behaviors at scale. And basically it's what it says and does. Culture is guided by purpose and values, and it gets put to the test by crisis as is happening right now with COVID-19. Among the values exhibited by cultures um, that are strong include collaboration, agility, integrity, people centricity, innovation, accountability, and ambition. Companies that exhibit a winning culture that have a strong internal compass and inspire their employees are nearly four times more likely to be leaders in business performance. And culture is essentially your company's internal compass, and this informs the actions that you'll take in times of crisis. So it's rough out there, we know that. Sherm is telling us that two in three employees are struggling with morale, and, and let's talk about that. What, what is this morale or employee satisfaction? Well, satisfaction, it's the, the state of a worker actually enjoying their job, but it doesn't necessarily mean being engaged with it. Um, while a satisfied employee might handle their job responsibilities decently, they're never really going to go above and beyond. And this is the key differentiation between engaged employees and satisfied workers. Employee engagement is actually something that occurs when workers are committed to helping their companies achieve all of their goals. Engaged employees are motivated to show up to work every day and, and do everything within their power to help the company to succeed. Well, what's fascinating today is what's happening is that employee engagement is actually on the increase. And Josh Burson, through his body of research, tells us that um, companies believe that their culture has improved, businesses believe that employee engagement has gone up and that em the employee experience is actually better. Well, why is this happening? Well, first, companies are, are actually putting workers first. They're giving employees more flexible benefits. They're improving work at home programs. They're giving them free wellness and other forms of education. And they're encouraging people to take, um, take vacation time. They're helping furloughed and laid off workers find new positions. Second, there's a, a huge increase uh, in focus on personal resourcefulness, well-being, and adaptability. And, I mean, working from home is pretty immediately brings up issues of social isolation, stress, and, and overall organization. And working from home demands a whole new set of practices around time management, collaboration, and teamwork with, with members of our own household and with business colleagues. And, well, the response from employers has been amazing. Companies are offering yoga and have exercise programs online and, and promoting the use of online tools that facilitate virtual collaboration. Here at Hub, we have an employee resource group called Hub Women Network, and it's a company-wide group that meets regularly, of course, not virtually, um, providing support and fellowship with a mission to engage, empower, and excel. And, and throughout this pandemic, the group's presence has really expanded. Um, just as an example. And then added to all of this is this massive increase in employee surveys and, and feedback. This, of course, has been a trend for years, but it's really accelerated overnight. And, and many, if, if not most, companies are doing open surveys and forums to, to listen and understand what's going on more than ever. Another key transformation is, is through expanded learning. Um, while companies have shut down, you know, in-person training, the consumption of online learning is skyrocketing. People are home. They want to learn about the crisis, their jobs, and what they can do to stay ahead and to be relevant. 
And getting employees to engage in training is typically a challenge, but, but now companies are clamoring for training across a broad range of topics. And, and this is a good thing because we need to remember that the, you know, the, the more balanced people are, the, the better they'll be able to perform. And this is all driving a leadership culture that's evolving. Top leaders are genuinely stepping up. The crisis is turning out to be one of our greatest learning experiences, and business and HR leaders can really learn about people and business and the economy and how to make their companies resilient and more sustainable in the future. And let's face it, working remotely is somewhat working well in some circumstances. And yes, it feels very costly and disruptive at first, but as a lot of studies are showing us, flexible work at home gives people a feeling of productivity, empowerment, and focus. And we're also finding that, that this is true in the way that we work with our clients and, and within our own teams. One thing that's going to be important is um, education around resiliency. And there are really two different issues here. There's individual resilience and organizational resilience. In general, individuals adapt pretty quickly while organizations adapt slowly. Well, that's all changed, and, and we're now learning that when we empower and care for people, they actually adapt and do pretty amazing things. Uh, we just have to give them the tools and the time and the culture to succeed. And then lastly here, there is a new and refocused investment in human resources and talent programs. And despite, despite the fact that budgets are being refactored in real time, companies are reinventing onboarding, investing in recruitment as many companies are, are really vastly changing their workforce needs, investing in training and reshaping their performance management programs. So I, I previously mentioned an, an evolved leadership culture and you know, leaders and employees really have to understand and support each other like we never have before. And it's, it's really interesting because leaders today are, they're sharing more about their own personal situations and challenges. And, and there's this new expectation around humanity, actively listening, supporting, and, and connecting. And leaders that demonstrate these qualities are, will earn greater trust and loyalty from their employees now and in the post-COVID world. And leaders really need to take hold of what's working today and integrate it quickly and into the everyday. And, and rather than you know, waiting for reentry and being reactive, we really need to prepare and set expectations for the ways that, that working in, in ways that will benefit the organization down the road. And one thing to really note here, you know, traditional hierarchy is, is gone and true leaders really have to step up and facilitate the flow of information across the organization. Managers have to make it easier for their people to work with and connect with one another. And they need to be removing roadblocks, creating structures that push decision-making out and down, and provide employees the tools and the training that they really need to empower them for, for local decision-making. So the net net at this point is that employee trust in business leaders has gone up. Employees see their senior leaders demonstrating a sincere interest in their well-being and have trust and confidence in the job being done by senior executives. And, and the bottom line on this crisis is an important lesson in business, which is when, when the company takes care of its people, the people take care of the company. So let's move on and talk a little bit about learning. So employees are anxious about the future. We, we know this less than four in 10 feel very confident that they will be able to, to continue to meet the requirements of their job successfully should the outbreak continue. And this is really kind of a heartbreaking statistic. We also know that during an emergency, it's, it's common for training budgets to be slashed. And we're really encouraging businesses not to do this. We, we should be considering um, some alternative strategies to keep investing in employee development during this crisis. And the first is offering ongoing support and coaching. We know that offering employees feedback helps them to do better work. And during a crisis, organizations really have to acknowledge and address anxiety and uncertainty. Employees want an emotional outlet and equally important, they wanna know about how they can, can continue to do good work and contribute in the future. And remember, that engaged worker really wants to know how they can contribute. Managers play a really important role here, specifically by operating more like coaches than bosses and more with more frequent check-ins and coaching conversations, which are really necessary right now. Yes, we definitely uh, will need to emphasize critical skills in our reimagined business of the future, 
Uh, but it's really important not to forget behavioral skills. Gallup has actually been doing a lot of research in this space, and, and what they're telling us is that in the future, behavioral skills will be the area with more significant skills gaps. And they've actually identified seven key expectations that stand out as some necessary behavioral skills for the, the future of our work. And this includes building relationships, developing people, leading change, inspiring others, thinking critically, communicating clearly, and, and creating accountability. We need to create a virtual network of learners. Uh, and, you know, developing a blended learning approach, both, you know, online and instructor-led, of course, Still virtually today uh, is most effective. And, and during the crisis, virtual learning, of course, has to be emphasized. But companies really ought to encourage peer to peer learning with other employees. This requires certainly requires investing in the right technology to enable this to happen. But equally important, it requires creating a culture where open feedback and dialogue and, and collaborative decision making are, are genuinely encouraged. And, and so this is the opportunity to really reassess your employee development strategy. We need to keep investing in employee learning and development. It matters. Um, so uh, curate this balanced learning and development program, one that brings the best of online, instructor-led, and experiential learning in a way that really supports employees through this crisis. And doing this effectively, you know, we know it will continue to motivate and inspire employees beyond the crisis. So let's talk a little bit about the online learning industry. Online learning, it really began in earnest uh, back in around 1998. It's an enormous marketplace, and it adapts really quickly to trends. Whenever there's a big technology or social change occurs, the market adapts quickly. In the early days in this market back in around the, the 2000s, it was all about putting corporate universities online, so companies like Skillsoft took off. And then we went through Google, YouTube, iPhone, and the whole idea of video learning really emerged. The last economic cycle, we found ourselves with too much content. So these true deliver content delivery systems became the center, and products like Precipio and Cornerstone came into the market. And since then, we've seen a real explosion in virtual reality. And this is where learners get on-demand access to these real-world scenarios in a safe environment. And with VR technology, businesses can gain unique insights to assess performance and impact. But integrated platforms are, are really what's picking up speed. This is because there are so many content providers in the market that companies are really wanting more destination solutions for their people. So rather than offer a yard sale of learning, they, they want a place to go, a place to learn, a place where experts can contribute and a place to really advance the state of knowledge. And that's, that's going to be largely virtual and, and where the market is headed. So in many ways, we're, we're in the middle of one of the biggest learning opportunities of our lives. Not only are we learning about viruses and pandemics, but we're learning about how to adapt our day, how to work at home, and how to evolve our business to this new world where safety, quality, and trust really have become our core values. So you're encouraged to open up your learning experience, keep it as simple as you can, offer lots of free content on topics that matter, and make sure that we're listening. Learning is all about individuals exploring and discovering and sharing new ideas. And in this whole world of economic and social stress, those are some things that we, we really need more than ever. So we're going to move forward and talk about performance. One of the biggest HR trends over the last decade has really been the shift away from individual performance to team performance. And the, the crisis is accelerating this as well. Research, research is showing us that about 90% of people who rate their company positively state that I'm being treated well and fairly by my peers. And we've genuinely entered this authentic era of collective thinking. Teams are coming together to, to listen to their people to talk and work together on projects like we never have before. People are helping one another, asking each other how they're doing, and listening more than ever. So being the, the first one in the office and the last one to leave uh, is, is no longer a measure of commitment and performance. In a post-COVID world, employees will be measured on what gets done and the value of that work rather than on the individual tasks and the time that it takes to get the work done. So this means that leaders really need to be providing 
a ton of clarity, um, crisp outcome-driven expectations so that people can deliver on goals. And we know that motivating employees to perform is going to require modeling and measurements uh, and being extremely clear on metrics. Companies really need to level set expectations for what drives organizational priorities and goals rather than, you know, discrete tasks. So here's some things, some things to be wary of. The, the COVID-19 crisis has just absolutely shoved home and work lives under the same roof for a lot of families. And what's really interesting is that the struggle to manage it all is now highly visible to our peers and our managers. Uh, and as people speculate on how the country may be forever changed as a result of the pandemic, we can hope that one shift will be a move away from this assumption that a 24-7 work culture is working well for anyone. For, for decades, scholars have described how organizations were built upon this implicit model of an ideal worker, one who is wholly devoted to their job and is available 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, every year of their career. And, and this was unrealistic. And it also presumed that a full-time caretaker was in the picture. But today, over two-thirds of American families are headed by either a single parent or two working parents. And with schools and daycares closed, we just, we just can't continue as normal simply because technology makes working remotely possible. We do know that um, some industries are designed this way, you know, around maybe legal, and, and workers are compensated for that kind of 24-7 environment. But what we're seeing in this experience is that some of the lower wage workers increasingly are subject to some of these similar expectations of responsiveness, even as they have less job security and less flexibility. So in the midst of this pandemic, um, store clerks, delivery drivers, warehouse workers are now having this ideal worker expectation pressed upon them. And we need to be looking at how work is done, which includes making more room for our families and understanding the value of the actual work day. And now is the time for companies to kind of take a step back and re-examine which traditional ways of working exist more out of convention rather than out of necessity. And we have the opportunity to choose quality work over quantity of work. Um, we need to be, you know, thoughtful about rewarding that faster response over the better response or the longer workday over a more productive workday. And this experience is really showing us that employees need greater choices in determining how their work and their families fit together. And if we can create a system that fits real workers and not just idealized ones, we can emerge from this crisis you know, healthier and happier and better performing. So this remote working, it's an opportunity for companies to kind of change their way of working sustainably and also, you know, benefit over the medium and longer term. If we think about less office space, less commuting, fewer business trips, a uh, greater focus for employees, um, it's definitely too early to say to what extent we will not go back to some of the old ways of working, um, but, but we should already be thinking about some potential um, potentials of some of these investments. And one is, you know, positive impact on remuneration systems, kind of like what we just talked about. Insights into HR opportunities. We also mentioned this a little bit ago. We're reinventing onboarding, investing in recruitment as many companies are, are vastly changing their workforce needs, investing in training and reshaping performance management programs, a new operational model based on higher flexibility, more agility, a corporate culture that's more connected internally and externally, and where we really have the ability to analyze data that's coming out of these collaboration exercises. Aligning our business goals to this new cultural standard and our employee expectations and, and data-driven methods of analysis to get deeper insights into these things like these learning patterns and, and employee sentiments. So we're going to move forward into recruiting. Um, back in, uh, in the fall, uh, October 2019, LinkedIn did a piece, and I call this the premonitions from October 2019, and this is what LinkedIn had to say about the, the state of recruiting back in the fall, uh, that the demand for recruiters has grown 63% since 2016. Recruiters are increasingly taking on an advisory role in their organizations. A recruiter's career path is shifting into one that requires business acumen, and that goes along with 
taking on more of a strategic advisory role. One in three recruiting heads comes out of business development, operations, and sales. Um, this means that recruiters are commonly using metrics to track not just their actions, but also outcomes, including things around you know, performance ratings, engagement, retention, and, and the quality of talent. Recruiters are going to need new skills so that they can analyze talent data to drive decisions, advising hiring managers. And again, this is back from last fall, 2019. At that time, the number one priority for recruiting organizations over the next five years would be to keep pace with rapidly changing hiring needs. Well, <laughs> that's really poetic given the recent state of affairs, which looks like this. And Recruiting today uh, has literally been turned on its ear. While some companies have scaled back in response to the pandemic, others are really hiring in mass. We're putting a lot of pressure on recruiters to source, engage, and hire candidates in a time when we know that in-person interviews and discussions are largely off the table. Technology continues to reshape recruiting, particularly in these tough times, and recruiters are going to find themselves leaning more on technology in the past. If we think about you know, one of the biggest challenges that the recruiting um, function is really going to be facing is just this massive influx of candidates. We thought we saw this back in 2008, 2009, that for every open job requisition, hundreds and hundreds of applications of a very broad range of skills and experiences that those re recruiters are now having to figure out ways to really manage that funnel and narrow those candidates down to move them through a pipeline and a hiring process. So, you know, those premonitions that LinkedIn had for how we were operating back in the fall, the expectations on our recruiting teams have, have now radically changed. We need, to, uh, we need to help managers and candidates uh, and make sure that we're not just shooting out a Zoom link and, and ha having them, you know, have at it. We need to provide some coaching and training and support so candidates can have a good experience um, coming through the process. We also anticipate that recruiting will, will be done largely by internal teams, um, but we'll still be looking to external niche recruiters to find candidates with more specific skills. And just one, one note about job postings. From a recruiting standpoint, it's important for candidates to understand the company's requirements and protocols during and in the wake of this COVID crisis. In line with job postings, Employers need to consider how they'll communicate their safety protocols, expectations of any candidates that visit the workplace for interviews, um, and when they arrive at work for their first day of employment and to perform their work. And likewise, employers should really be communicating any pre-screening requirements for new hires and, and any other ongoing requirements. All right, we're going to push forward to technology. I know we've sprinkled technology throughout the discussion, but let's spend a, a little more time here. So we know that touching things, being uh, with other people, breathing the air in an enclosed space, we, we know that those things can be considered risky. And the comfort of being in the presence of others is being replaced with a greater comfort with absence, especially with those that we don't know really well. And we're going to be finding ourselves in a place of, you know, instead of asking, is there a reason to do this online, we're going to be asking ourselves, is there any good reason to hold this meeting in person. And this pandemic, it's, it's really reshaping the workplace. Social distance thinking is, is going to be a part of our DNA moving forward. This means that people are going to want more space. And following the last recession, um, companies had been trying to do more with less space. And that meant packing more and more people into office, open office spaces, which is a practice that's called desensification excuse me, that's called densification. A densification defined as companies that cutting down on both the size and number of private offices and squeezing more people into large open rooms, having small breakout rooms, food areas, telephone quiet areas and conference rooms. And in 2016, this, this concept really took hold and a lot of businesses were putting together, you know, very cool offices with these open environments. Um, and creating this, this densification effect. Well, densification is out, <laughs> definitely going to be taking a hiatus. And we'll start asking this question, you know, how do we de-densify to create the physical dis distancing that we now know that we need to have? And this, along with that expanded preference to meet online rather than in person, it's really changing how companies are meeting with their teams, clients, and prospects 
along with just overall daily operations. So a more virtual workplace means that information technology will really need to be at the top of its game as well. And how efficient or inefficient a company is with their technology, it won't just depend on infrastructure, but IT staff as well. And it's, you know, it's that same IT staff, they're the ones who are building and creating and maintaining the tools that allow a company's employees to be productive with their own technology. So in a more virtual workplace, IT will become more necessary than ever as remote work brings new challenges around security and support capabilities. And employers will need a strong IT staff to support both in and out of office employees. The new policies will need to be written and maintained as, as our infrastructure changes. And in collaboration with business operations, will also likely be tasked with creating or finding tools that gather metrics around you know, remote working performance. So how do we remain on the cutting edge of remote working and other types of software offerings to increase productivity and keep us prepared for future disruption? We need to be asking ourselves some of these questions. You know, are we investing in remote work technologies or expanding our own programs, including um, you know, laptops, uh, for these workforce segments that we didn't have before? And how might we leverage artificial intelligence? Um, uh, what are our employee processes that are uh, ripe for greater digit digitization? And how might, we, how might we leverage technology to monitor the engagement, productivity, productivity and well-being of our workforce? And we also need to ask ourselves, is this a good time to look at cost negotiations or, or vendor shifts? Um, this, this is the time to be looking at all of these components. So let's take just a minute and, and take a look at what comes next. We've already talked about culture and performance, learning, and, and some technology, but I do want to give some honorable mention to a few other areas. The first is overall workforce planning. How will we rethink the overall composition and size of the workforce? What are contractors? Or what about contractors and other vendors? What's our overall people strategy and how has this crisis changed skills requirements? And we already talked about some um, emphasis on things like behavioral skills and where we anticipate to see some gaps. We're going to need to revamp our overall people strategy. And let's talk for a moment about compensation. This is an area that will continue to evolve as we think about base compensation, variable comp incentives, our compensation vendors who provide us with market data are still working through, through what this is going to look like and how to provide meaningful data. And this will be really important as we reshape compensation programs and continue to focus on issues around pay equity. And then around workforce reduction, you know, how are we engaging employees who may have been laid off and, and what can we learn from the entire workforce reduction process? And so, that's everything I have from you in terms of, uh, of the formal presentation. I really appreciate your time and working through those materials. Would love to take a little bit of time right now. I'm going to hand it back over to Skip, who's going to uh, facilitate some Q&A for us. Uh, Andrea, thank you very much for that thought-provoking presentation. We have some questions from the audience, and I'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, just give me one second here. Um, First question, um, you talked about the four out of 10 people, you know, are not sure they're going to be able to, you know, meet their job requirements. Do you have any breakdown in terms of the age of that, you know, cohort of people? Was it all workers or was it more focused on more senior workers or more junior workers? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't have a breakdown and that would be more of a broad perspective across all workers. Um, but that is an interesting question and especially, you know, just, in, in thinking about the question, it would be different across industry as well. And um, I think the most important part of that is that there's a couple pieces. Employees today are anxious about a couple of things. Number one, how can I be relevant in my job today? I mean, there's so much stress out there. Employees are worried about losing their job. They're wanting to contribute. And so there's there's a lot of angst about doing well in my job today. And, and again, keeping myself and my job re relevant. And then in the future, what does that look like? And so a lot of this is, is driven, that's a, that's a great question in terms of 
um, you know, the demographics of the question and where that comes from. But no, the answer, the, the, the statistic itself is, is just more broad. Okay, good. Um, what are some best practices for onboarding leaders virtually? Again, in the past, you know, everybody came in, especially, you know, more senior types came in for rounds of interviews with lots of people, et cetera. Um, has that obviously going to change? And any thoughts on that topic? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and the best thing that we can do right now is it's so much of it is around organization and communication. So incoming, you know, onboarding uh, individuals, leaders to an organization, the, just as we would if it were in person, um, where it's critical that they, you know, learn the things they need to about the organization, they have an opportunity, opportunity to meet, engage with, and develop relationships with other key leaders. You know, that is a part of, you know, that needs to be organized and structured. We can certainly do that virtually. Um, we have a uh, um, a client that we've recently helped onboard a a new um, leader. And so much of it is, like I said, around organization. And there's no intention for this leader to come into the office until we're through this shelter-in-place scenario. And so there's a very thoughtful plan in place about that individual being matriculated into the organization and how that's going to roll out. But the, the best thing I can say is do as much as you can to have a similar onboarding and integration experience it's around organization and, st- and structuring it virtually. Okay, good. Um, with the increased focus on recruiting and high response rates from candidates, will there be an even heavier reliance on automated screening of qualifications? And what advice can you offer on how qualified candidates can best adapt to increase the possibility of making it past the automated <laughs> screening process? And how can internal recruiters best assure they're seeing the most qualified applicants. Well, if I if I had I, I would give anything to have the, the best answer for that question because that is that is going to be, you know, some of the, the biggest question and and um you know the just the the structure around well I'll take it first from the candidate's perspective. Um being able to present oneself from a skill standpoint, because if we think about the, like I said, the automated screening, the AI, the search engines that are in place today, being able to really with clarity put forward skills, competencies, um, both, you know, um, uh, behavior-based skills, being able to articulate those in the best way possible will, and specific to the roles will, provide the greatest likelihood of being able to move forward through that pre-screening process, you know, businesses to the extent that they're able are going to want to employ what, whatever they can do, whether it's from their own capabilities, cost, um, because this high volume of applications, uh, it is going to be significant and whatever we can do to help help create a screening process that's viable um, will be meaningful. The, the other thing to, to really put out there is that we need to make sure that whatever we put in place, that it is, um, it is reliable and consistent across candidates um, because the, we are trying to take it away from being a manual process, but it also needs to be consistent and you want something that is going to, you know, really accurately help you narrow those candidates down. So, you know, huge, um, you know, thumbs up for technology and, and utilizing that in every way possible. Um, it just has to be consistent and, um, and consistently applied. Okay, good. Um, what benefits do you think are going to be lost in the new work realities? Employers want to do more, but with losses and things probably going to suffer, And what benefits do you think are most likely going to be impacted or changed? For example, a lot of companies used to give a a commuting benefit, you know, a pre-tax or tax-free commuting benefit. Is that going to be important in the future? Yeah. Um, I think we're going to see a big swing toward learning and education. We're going to see people who are wanting to uh, go back to formal education, I think, 
Um, tuition reimbursement programs are going to be important. We're going to see people wanting to retool across the board. And so when we, you know, a lot of times we don't necessarily think about learning and education as a, as a benefit, but it is under a strong total rewards program, it, it is a key benefit. So learning and development, I think, is going to be one area that, that employees are, are really going to find significant. You know, time off programs, that's one of the things that is really awkward in, um, in a remote environment, not so much the time off program itself, but just time off. We're really encouraging uh, organizations to make sure that they're encouraging their people to take time off. And just because we're working at home, um, you know, doesn't mean that those time off programs, in fact, they're more important. And so I think we'll see focus around paid time off programs, how those are structured, what those look like. And yeah, you're right, commuter benefit is a great example where that certainly is, is going to shift. We're, we're, you know, one of the other things that's going to be extremely important, and I mentioned this early in the presentation, is getting feedback from the workforce because every workforce is different and what drives and motivates individuals from a reward standpoint is different. And so it will be key to engage the workforce, gather information, understand what are motivators so that those benefit programs and reward, overall reward programs can be shaped in a way that, that is meaningful for the organization. Okay. Um, this next question, it deals with the whole concept of people who are employees versus, in effect, independent contractors. There's been a move by the government to call more contractors employees. Much of this is defined by the amount of direction that's being given to the contractor. As we move to defining results required rather than how it's done or the time required, compounded by the reassessment of the workforce, will we be inadvertently moving to more contract workers? Here's the job. Get it done. We don't care how you do it. Well, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, the, you know, the 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 rules around contractors and what defines a contractor are still critical. Yeah, you know, I I don't. This is my own opinion. I don't think that that will result in a swing toward more contractor usage, largely because you know, the sense that we're getting from, well, from businesses, but also, you know, our, our government is the desire to continue to employ people, put people back to work, get people, you know, returning people to the workforce and earning bona fide paychecks. And so, um, you know, I hope this isn't just wishful thinking on my part, but uh, the, I, I, I do believe that that is the direction that that will go uh, as opposed to a swing toward more contractor usage, you know, for the for the reasons mentioned, I, I I do believe that the emphasis is going to continue to be reemployment, getting people back to you know paying jobs and getting things you know going back in that direction. Okay, um, employers are encouraging balancing work as well as the new personal priorities due to COVID. And because of limited caretaker support, there's been news, recent news reports that more employers are monitoring employees using technology. Employees are having to waive privacy rights to allow employers to monitor their online use. What are your thoughts on this, particularly as employees are now mixing more work and personal priorities throughout the week? <laughs> Well, one of the things that is the most important in this remote working environment is is trust. And, I, I, you know, there are a lot of things that employers can do to um, support and encourage a productive remote workforce, um, which includes things like, you know, confirming expectations in advance, making clear you know, uh, the, what is expected, understanding and acknowledging, uh, you know, agreements that are laid out in advance, managers creating methods for holding teams accountable around communication, um, you know, measuring timelines and deliverables. And that that really is where I feel the focus will be going forward is really looking at results and outcomes and quality of work that, that is, that, that's coming out. And that's where, 
you know, the best thing we can do is make sure that there are very clear expectations of the work, the role, and the output, and there's clear communication and regular and ongoing check-ins between managers and the workforce. Um, you know, tech, technologically monitoring performance, if that's, you know, mon monitoring, you know, time online and things like that, you know, that's challenging just because it, there's a there's a, a challenge there around trust and there's no way to get around there's no way to get around you know this this critical element of trust between managers and leaders on the workforce and you know the things that we can put in place from a feedback and communication standpoint and setting expectations and really looking at deliverables and outcomes will go far in um, you know in, in, in creating and being able to monitor those outputs I don't know if I've answered the question. I'm not trying to skirt the question, but I'm really trying to redirect it toward, you know, toward trust and what we're doing in terms of how we're directly engaging with the workforce. Okay. Well, the next question is really on the whole topic of, um, I'll call it, for lack of a better word, pay disparity. We've seen over the last several months, and it's put into sharp focus, you know, the disparity between, you know, the, the amount of pay of very high executives versus people that stock shelves. Um, and, and that disparity has historically, you know, gotten wider and wider. Do you think there's going to be a move afoot, again, not necessarily to, you know, cut $20 million salaries down to $2 million, but do you think there's a move afoot, or are you seeing a move to get, to, to value people more and make those disparities less? Well, I'm going to adjust, I'm going to address pay equity in a, in a couple of different ways that, just in terms of, of pay equity across, you know, groups of people in similar roles. I mean, I, I think that there's, there, will there, there will continue to be a focus there. What's happening, what, what's the, the awkwardness of what's happening in, the comp in compensation right now is around, you know, market data and trends. And, you know, every business is doing something seemingly different nowadays, you know, we have businesses that are taking across the board adjustments. We have businesses that are taking, taking deep adjustments and some more modest. There are uh, changes going on, other sorts of cost containment uh, changes going on around bonuses and incentive plans. And the challenge that we're going to have going forward is that number one, it's still unsure what is, you know, how that's going to work. Um, but number two is, you know, the market data is not available to us. We have, you know, companies where we're, we're gathering market data, where we're more deeply understanding what's going on and trends out in the market, and that's simply not available to us yet. And so I, I can't really say that in, in answer to the direct question if we're going to be seeing a, a trend to kind of bridge those gaps, but what I can say is that we don't have the information yet, and our colleagues who manage that kind of data are, are still working on it and they're working closely together to figure how, how they're going to make that information available to us. Okay. Um, another quick one. Do you have any quick hits on how senior management can best demonstrate, you know, back to this whole employee trust thing, you know, quick ways that management can demonstrate to employees the trust that's going to be critical with all this remote work that's going on? Yeah, you know, the, the best thing that managers can do, honestly, is just really, really communicate well and on a, on a regular and ongoing basis. And I, I, I don't mean just the big, you know, town hall presentations. I mean regular and ongoing direct check-ins. How are you doing, um, you know, connecting one-on-one. -on -one. And this is where, you know, I mentioned earlier that the hierarchy is gone. It's those frontline managers that are out really facilitating the flow of information across the organization. And we need to make sure that those individuals, those frontline leaders have the tools and resources to do what they need to do in order to be in close contact with, um, with, uh, you know, with, with their teams and individuals on a regular and ongoing basis. And it's recognizing the work and the output. And, and I really believe that if we're doing that more consistently in these times when our employees are really looking for more feedback and emotional support, that's the best thing that we can be doing for them at this point. And maybe the quick one last follow-up on that, maybe the whole issue of, you know, the classic annual performance review. Is that pretty much over now? And as opposed to constant feedback, um, 
to, to see how people are you know, performing either by their immediate manager or managers above them. Is, is the annual performance review over? Yeah, well, that's, that's a bigger question outside of the pandemic. Is the annual performance review over? Um, for right now, you know, here's kind of the answer to that. If, if the performance review process for your organization is, is you know, and, you're, do, and you've, you're still, you know, doing annual reviews, and it's a fairly established process, meaning, you know, you've gone through that process for more than, say, two cycles, um, you know, and is a large part of the workforce still working, then sure, you know, go ahead with that process, you know, although it may be more virtual, but you can still, you know, kind of stay with the process like that. But if the answer to the, any of those two questions was no, then it may make more sense to to pause on what might be your typical process and do something you know, more abbreviated. Goal setting is really the piece that that is tough. You know, you know, even mid and longer term goals are just not helpful right now. Um, we need to be looking at you know monthly goals at most. Um, you know, and what can we get done together as a team? Those are the things we need to really be looking at, and then those more regular, ongoing you know check ins. So I think we'd like to, at this point, wrap up. Um, I'd like to, um, for those attendees who have questions that haven't been answered. Or if you have additional issues you'd like to discuss, you're invited to reach out to Andrea's colleague, Liz Yarger, who's been on the call with us today. Liz's contact information is on the screen, and her email address is quite simple. It's liz.yarger, Y-A-R-G-E-R, at hubinternational.com. And Liz will make sure your issues are promptly addressed by Andrea and her team. So this concludes today's presentation. I'd like to personally thank Andrea for her insightful commentary and recommendations. 